Hey, what's up, Seekers? Welcome back. Something very odd happens in the very last chapter of Maimonides' guide, his philosophical magnum opus, perhaps the greatest book of Jewish philosophy ever written, which remains an elusive puzzle still now 800 years later, even for those that have studied it for decades. Maimonides, in part 3, chapter 51, lays out in stunning detail the pinnacle of religious worship and human striving, culminating in an immortal union with the divine, what he calls the kiss of death by the mouth of God, God's self, the peak of his mystical religious journey. However, the guide does not end with that peak of religious experience and erotic mystical ecstasy, nor does it end with the striving to know God and unite with God intellectually, and neither does it end in the depths of silent praise in which nothing can be said of God at all. But instead, it ends with a final magnificent idea which beautifully combines all three. Join us as we conclude Maimonides' magnificent guide to see Maimonides' final teaching to the perplexed to make sense of his ultimate final word to the seeker. Hope you enjoy. There are two prevalent interpretations of Maimonides bouncing around. One is of Maimonides as the arch-rationalist of medieval Judaism, who sees the intellect and the intellectual knowledge of God as the highest aim to which a human can aspire, and the other through the works of people like Blumenthal, Frodenthal, Fowler, Fried, Citron, Lobel, Ruidowitz, Ivry, and others, is that of Maimonides as a secret mystic, although it isn't much of a secret anymore given how many scholars have been working on this idea the past few decades. It seems to me that both of these positions, Maimonides as a rationalist and Maimonides as a mystic, are both true and not mutually exclusive at all, but in fact actually mutually interdependent, but both of them just need a bit of tweaking and correcting to see how they fit well with one another. Throughout this series, we've been focusing on sketching out Maimonides' relationship to mysticism in some fine detail, and part of the challenge in doing that is that mysticism means so many different things to so many different people. A dominant perception of mysticism is one brimming with connotations of otherworldliness, transcendence, aloofness, and a solitary hovering above terrestrial life by a couple inches at least, in which the events and occurrences of daily activity and behavior are dim in comparison to the high life of the mystic high up somewhere in the Himalayas or in the supernatural, supernal metaphysical realms. I think that this is, generally speaking, a pretty poor conception of mysticism, both because it's unhelpful for those attempting to understand and practice mysticism in their own lives, and more pertinently here, because it's simply largely inaccurate. And I think that there may be no better candidate at the present moment in the context of this series to demonstrate that inaccuracy for us, to give the lie to the picture of the aloof, alone, absent mystic than Moses Maimonides himself. Let us turn then to the final chapter of the guide, Guide 354, to see this for ourselves. If you've been following along the series with us, for our exhilarating excursion through the philosophy of Maimonides as found in his Guide for the Perplexed, you'll know that Maimonides' sole goal and aim is to inculcate in his reader the understanding that the final perfection of mankind is to be found in, quote, the attainment of a correct understanding of things divine, namely, in an accurate knowledge of God. That is the ultimate perfection to which a human can strive in Maimonides' vision. Maimonides continues this theme right up until the very last chapter of the guide, Guide 354, by concluding his great work with a discussion of four different types of perfection, placing them in ascending order from worst to greatest, beginning with the pursuit of perfection in wealth and possessions, which he criticizes as a foolish pursuit, followed next by the pursuit of bodily perfection, health and strength, followed thirdly by moral perfection, the perfection of one's character traits, and onto the final and highest perfection, which of course is intellectual perfection, which leads to a perfect knowledge of God. This knowledge of God is the highest aim for which the human can strive on Maimonides' account, even though he may believe that we can never truly know God. About this fourth and final perfection, perfection of the intellect, Maimonides writes to his student, You must aim to attain this perfection. You ought not to continue to work and wear yourself for that which belongs to others, whilst neglecting your own soul until it has entirely lost its original purity. And, with this perfection you have obtained your final goal in true human perfection, it remains belonging to you alone, bestowing immortality upon you, and on its account alone are you called human. Maimonides backs up this hierarchy of perfections, property, body, moral, and intellect, by citing the prophet Jeremiah, who in turn quotes the highest authority of all, God. 
Thus saith the Lord, writes Jeremiah, Let not the wise glory in their wisdom, neither let the mighty glory in their might, nor the rich glory in their riches. But let one that glories glorify in this, that they understand and know me, saith the Lord. In these concise prophetic verses, Maimonides reads his entire program for human perfection. The prophet, counting down backwards, rejects wealth and property, might and health, and wisdom, namely good morals and characters, as legitimate reasons for pride and glory, leaving the only perfection worth pursuing and glorifying in the fourth and final knowledge of God, which Maimonides calls true wisdom, as opposed to morality and character, which is a lower form of wisdom. So far so good, this all seems pretty consistent with the rational Maimonides we all know and love. The Maimonides who values rationality and the intellect above all else, who believes that the worship of those who have apprehended the true realities is the highest form of religious worship, who sees knowledge of metaphysical truths as the peak of religiosity, a Maimonides for whom the intellect alone is the absolute measure of perfection and hence the telos, the final end goal of all humanity. All this, which seems by the way to be quite well rooted in the text of Maimonides, may lead us to mistakenly conjure up a Maimonides who envisions the perfect human being as a coldly rational thinking machine, and we might even paint Maimonides himself in the picture of this perfect human. However, if we read the final chapter of the guide carefully, we find a different highest aim and perfection to which Maimonides aspires and invites us, the reader, to aspire to along with him. It is neither a mere academic, cerebral, perfect metaphysical knowledge of God, nor is it an ecstatic mystical experience, the kiss of death which seems to be the culmination of his religious path in 351. Rather, Maimonides continues the path by citing the very next verse from the prophet Jeremiah, writing somewhat astonishingly, the prophet does not contend himself with positing the knowledge of God as the highest perfection, for if this would have been his intention, he would have ended there. But Maimonides observes that the verse continues, Let one who glorifies glory in this, that they understand and know me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight, saith the Lord. The peak of human perfection, according to Maimonides, is indeed to know God, but the peak of human knowledge of God, as he writes, is the endeavor to imitate and resemble God by exercising the divine qualities of chesed, loving kindness, mishpat, justice, and staka, righteousness, in one's own life, and not off in the heaven somewhere, but down here on this very earth, ba'aretz, as the prophetic verse writes. Just to get a little technical for a second, since Maimonides maintains that we as humans are unable to know God's essence, but only God's actions which constitute God's attributes, Maimonides must, if there's to be any knowledge obtained concerning God, move his final goalpost in the very last moment from contemplating God to imitating God, transposing the idea of knowledge of God from the metaphysical into the moral sphere. From an abstract knowledge of God, of which we with our limited minds can never gain perfect comprehension, to the moral realm of action, where knowing God means to be godly, to be kind like God, just like God, and righteous like God, as much as humanly possible. Maimonides points us back then to Guide 154, where he interprets the magnificent episode from Exodus 33, where Moses asks to see the glory of God, Harini Noas Kvedecha, and is told that he is unable to see the face of God, for none shall see me and live. Namely, as interpreted by Maimonides, no one, not even Moses, can know the essence of God, which is referred to in the verse as the glory of God, and certainly not while one is alive. But, writes Maimonides, Moses' earlier request, show me your ways in verse 13, was granted, and these ways that were shown to Moses were God's actions emanating from God's attributes of action, which are, as we read there in the very next chapter, Hashem, Hashem, Kelrachim, Vachanun, Erech, Apaim, Barav, Chesed, Ve'emes, Neitzer, Chesed, La'alafim, Neitzer, Avon, Vafesha, Vachata, Vanahake, Lord, Lord, benevolent God, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and truth, preserving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. These ways, notes Maimonides, are what the sages referred to as the Yud Gimel Midot the 13 attributes or qualities of God's mercy.
Maimonides writes that the reason these 13 qualities or attributes are enumerated for us is so that we should acquire similar attributes and act accordingly. And it is with these words, followed by a prayer, that Maimonides concludes his puzzle, The Guide for the Perplexed. The object of the above passage from the prophet Jeremiah is therefore to declare that the perfection in which one can truly glory is attained by one who has acquired the knowledge of God as far as is humanly possible. Having acquired this knowledge, one will then be determined always to seek loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness, and thus to imitate the ways of God, as we have explained many times in this treatise. Echoing and alluding to what he writes in part 1, chapter 54 of the guide, for the chief aim of mankind should be to make themselves, as far as possible, similar to God. That is to say, to make our actions similar to those of God, as our sages expressed it when explaining the verse, Thou shalt be holy, the sages say, Just as God is gracious, so shall you be gracious. Just as God is merciful, so shall you be merciful. Maimonides here in the final chapter of the guide, gives quite a radical rereading of his entire project of the human attempt to know God, which up until now, even in this very last chapter, in the earlier half of it, has been framed as the highest perfection to which a human ought to strive. But here Maimonides adds something, and that is that this knowledge of God, if it is to be complete, cannot remain abstract, but it must lead to a concrete desire to imitate God, with divine proportions of loving kindness, compassion, justice, and forgiveness. Or perhaps we could say like this, that on Maimonides' account, to fully know God as much as humanly possible, one must be God, embodying God's actions and attributes. Anything less just misses the point. And this ethic of imitating God doesn't just remain a nice bit of philosophical theory for the elite students of the guide to ponder and scratch their heads over. If we look across to Maimonides' Mishneh Torah, his magnum opus of Jewish law, which he writes for the masses, we can see him enshrine these principles as a matter of legal legislation for every single Jew. In explaining the biblical commandment to walk in God's ways of Halach the Bidrachav in the first book of his Mishneh Torah, Maimonides writes, The sages taught thus, just as God is called gracious, so must you be gracious. Just as God is called merciful, so must you be merciful. And just as God is called holy, so must you be holy. Thus did the prophets call God by these various attributes, enduringly patient, master of loving kindness, righteous and upright, perfect, mighty and powerful, and so forth, to teach us that these qualities are correct and right, and that we are obligated to cultivate them, and thus imitate God as far as one can, Thus writes Maimonides in his halachic work written to every single Jew, man, woman, and child, in his Mishnah Torah, Sefer Mada, Hilchas Deus 1.6. Here we see this principle of v'halachta bidrachav, walking in God's ways, imitatu dei as it's known in Latin, enshrined as a matter of religious duty and obligation of the highest level, a biblical obligation no less, upon every single Jew. And we can see this halachic principle slip over into practical halachic legislation in Maimonides' legal treatment of the concept of slavery in Book 12 of his Mishnah Torah, where, commenting on Leviticus 2546, 700 years, mind you, before the end of slavery in the United States, with the Emancipation Proclamation and the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, Maimonides writes, Although it is technically lawful to rigorously work a heathen slave, the attribute of benevolence and way of wisdom demand that one be merciful and strive for justice. One accordingly should not make their slaves yoke heavy, nor torment them, but should give them to eat and drink of everything one has, to feed them from one's own plate, even before one themselves has partaken to eat from it. Neither should a master disgrace their servant, physically or verbally, because the law has subjected them only to servitude, but not to disgrace. Neither should one scream at their servants in anger, but should speak softly and hear their complaints. As we find in the proper words of Job, if I reject the claim of my servant when they complain against me, what will I do when God rises to judge me? How will I answer when called to account? Did not the one that made me in the womb also make them? Did not God fashion us the same both in the womb? Thus, in speaking of the divine attributes, Maimonides concludes, which we are commanded to imitate, the psalmist writes, God's mercy is over all that God has made, v'rachmav al kol ma'asav, and so shall be our mercy. Here, the biblical law, to quote Jonathan Gorski, is brought into dialogue with the telos, the goal of imitato dei, of imitating God, and the prospectively cruel relationship of master and slave is rehumanized and transformed. 
taking the verse at face value would have compromised the ultimate ideals of the tradition and seriously damaged the humane integrity of the master as well as inflicting cruelty and hurt upon the slave. Furthermore, it would not have been in accordance with the will of God, whose compassion for all creation would have been completely negated. We see here that it's not just Maimonides' abstract philosophy, but also his practical legal rulings, which are clearly touched by an unspoken commitment to a passionate and profound love of a passionate and loving God. As we hinted to in the end of last episode, there are two different ways of reading this final chapter of the guide with its unexpected turn to ethics. Shlomo Pines, who we discussed last time, reads Maimonides' ethical conclusion as a defeat, signifying his disillusionment with theology and his abandonment of metaphysics. Since, according to Pines' readings, Maimonides comes to the conclusion that nothing could be known of God at all, we're best focusing our attention to society and politics to practical concerns of advising our kin to be kind to one another. Other scholars, however, have suggested an alternative reading to this end of the story in line with a more mystical reading of Maimonides' guide. Against a reading of an aloof and detached mysticism of getting high on one's own supply, a hedonistic trip on the bliss of God, Maimonides follows up his mystical kiss of death not only with a practical call to action, but he lays out what is in fact the inevitable logical and moral consequence of the mystical experience. If one encounters God in the depths of the self and the other, even becoming, according to some readings, one with God, and is not filled with a profound love and compassion for all of existence, then something along the way has gone seriously wrong. Maimonides' mysticism mandates that in discovering, encountering, and perhaps even uniting with God what he calls knowing God, one as a direct and natural consequence cannot but be filled with divine levels of loving kindness justice and righteousness, which must extend as he writes and legislates to all beings, even to a foreign slave, bestowing upon them rights, compassion, and dignity, sowing the seeds of compassion that would ultimately legislate cruel practices such as slavery out of existence. The experience of God, which is infinite, cannot be bounded, and inevitably overflows into a sense of responsibility for all of God's creation. The true mystic, following their mysticism to its logical conclusion, is one who sees no alternative than to love, forgive, support, hope, redeem, share, and encourage, for the secret has been revealed to them and the illusion of separation and otherness has fallen away in their knowledge of God. And in that spirit, they must go on to perpetuate God's attributes and actions of loving kindness, infinite patience, and a thousand generations of forgiveness. This ethical conclusion is not despite Maimonides' theology and metaphysics as per Pines, but is precisely because of them, it is their perfect summation and culmination. Mystical contemplation and experience may for moments have a tendency to take one out of this world, but ultimately, as demonstrated by Jeremiah and his ragtag band of prophets, both in ancient Israel and across the world's traditions, an encounter with God or ultimate reality, must bring us back to reality with renewed moral vigor and wellsprings of compassionate love. It is for this reason that Maimonides does not conclude the guide on the high note of mystical ecstasy in chapter 351, but pushes his pen further, beyond ecstasy to ethics and action, not ending with unification with God, but with imitato Dei, with becoming God's arms and legs down here on this fine earth, in small divine acts of goodness and kindness, in a smile and a helping hand, therein lies eternity, and therein lies infinity. I just want to say that I know sometimes we get caught up here on the channel on the scholarly details and the academic debates and minutia, and don't get me wrong, we love it and we hope you do too. The devil is, after all, in the details. But the real point of doing all this is so that we conclude with words like these, words of hope and encouragement, kindness and tenderness, words for the soul in a world which so desperately needs them. All of the footnotes and sources, research and mental efforts is worth it if it brings us to conclusions like these, if only we could now embody them. And perhaps Maimonides felt that way too. Maybe he felt that all of his tedious chapters of biblical linguistic analysis, the slow and careful work of clearing out the literalistic cobwebs of the mind, was all worth it if it allowed him to close with a message like this, chesed, mishpat and sedek, loving kindness, charitable justice, and honest righteousness, built not as a pie in the sky, castles in the air, wishful, flaky, fluffy, hippie thinking, but as a categorical imperative grounded firmly in the best science, philosophy, and religion of his day, a love grounded in what Maimonides takes to be a tightly argued 
rational demonstration unavoidably following from the first principles of his axioms and premises. A coherent and consistent compassion congruent with humanity's highest ethical and aesthetic strivings, and a supreme answer to the question of the good life, if there ever was one. To return, unfortunately, for but a moment from the poetry to the philosophy. This reading of Maimonides' ethical imperative also resolves the apparent glaring contradiction in Guide 354. If you remember, Maimonides began by listing four perfections which the human may strive for, putting them in ascending order from least to most worth pursuing, the lowest being perfection of property and possessions, the second bodily perfection, the third was moral perfection, the perfection of one's character traits, which Maimonides writes, most of the commandments of the Torah serve no other end than the attainment of this perfection of character, but even this perfection, number three, the perfection of the morals of the individual, writes Maimonides, is no end in itself, but is only a preparation for another perfection, and that fourth and final perfection, writes Maimonides, as we've been saying, is the perfection of the intellect, which comes with knowledge of God. Maimonides seems quite clearly here in his ordering of perfections to be prioritizing intellectual knowledge of God over ethics and morality. Why then does Maimonides seemingly switch at the very end of the chapter to say that the prophet Jeremiah does not contend with positing the knowledge of God as the highest perfection, but instead goes on to declare that the perfection in which one can truly glorify is attained by one who has acquired the knowledge of God and then will be determined always to seek loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness to imitate the ways of God. Here Maimonides seems to flip the order of the final two perfections, placing the ethics of imitating God beyond mere knowledge of God. Or at least he does not see knowledge of God as being complete until there is an ethical outcome. Either way, seemingly placing ethics as the final goal instead of relegating it to a third tier perfection. It seems that the answer here is that Maimonides calls for us to imitate God's loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness is clearly not synonymous with the third perfection of morals of character that one comes to possess, which is surely better than the material or bodily perfections, but is still a possession that isn't intrinsic to oneself, to one's own being. The ethics of imitato dei, of imitating God, is not some kind of moral perfection that one accumulates, achieves, and adds to their resume. It is that which flows as an automatic and unstoppable consequence of the true knowledge of God. It is part and parcel of knowing God in a deep, mystical, rational sense. It is its highest, truest expression. The first set of ethics, therefore, the moral character perfections, perfection number three, the purification of one's own moral character, we can speak of, as Maimonides does, as a prerequisite to the proper knowledge of God, and the second ethic of imitating God, a life of moral action, we can see as an outcome of that very same proper knowledge of God, an outcome whose absence indicates an incompleteness of knowledge. This ethics as the outcome of knowledge is particularly on point when speaking of a God whose essence is unknowable, a God whom we can only perceive the attributes of God's actions. Knowing such a God then can and must only find its highest expression in the emulation of God's attributes and actions of loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. And there is no knowing that is greater than that. It is a knowing which is being. To put this in other words, for Maimonides, the ultimate knowing is being, and his solution to knowing a god who cannot be known is to be the best god that you can be. If god were somehow knowable, then we could continue our intellectual effort of trying to know god in the hopes of knowing god, but with a god that can never be known, whose essence is fundamentally unknowable, but whose actions of kindness and justice can be known, the best we can come to knowing god is being god in an imitation of god's kindness, justice, and compassion. Maimonides' position here puts an interesting spin on the classic Jewish theological formulation of God's unfathomability for illu yudativ hayisiv, if one would know God, they would be God, writes Yosef Albo in Sefer HaIkarim. Maimonides might have posthumously replied in the affirmative, yudativ hayisiv, that which we can know of God, we can be, and in being God, we somehow know God. And thus Maimonides concludes chapter 354, and with these final words closes the guide. This is all that I thought proper to discuss in this treatise, and which I considered useful for those like yourself. I hope that by the grace of God you will, after due reflection, comprehend all the things which I have treated here. And may God grant us and all of Israel with us to attain that which God promised to us through the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, 
Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The people who walked in darkness will have seen a great light. Upon they that have dwelt in the shadow of death has the light dawned. God is near to all who call. If they call to God in truth and turn to God, God is found by all who seek. If they march towards God and go not astray. Amen. I just wanted to add an afterthought that my friend Jeff Radin brought to my attention, that if we look at Maimonides' own life and the path that he chose for himself, it doesn't seem like he chose the life of mystical seclusion, which he speaks of in 351. Instead, it seems that he chose or had thrust upon him, first by his rabbinic upraising and then with the tragic sudden death of his brother, an immensely busy life of public service, spiritual and political leadership, with endless duties and responsibilities to his local community, to the royal court, and to Jewish communities far and wide, as we've been made privy to in his letter to Ibn Tibbon, which we read from the very first episode in this series, and in his pastoral letters, a relentless, endless life of duty and responsibility, one after another, with barely a moment to sleep, eat, breathe, think, certainly not the ideal conditions for a life of meditation. Would Maimonides have preferred a simpler, quieter life of meditation and contemplation, a life of seclusion, pursuing intellectual enlightenment and the knowledge of God through the study of science and philosophy, like he writes in 154, almost spinozistically about his own philosophical hero Moses, that God promised to show him the whole of creation to make him comprehend the nature of all things, their relation to each other, and the way they are governed by God, both in reference to the universe as a whole and to each creature in particular. Maimonides, it seems, writes these words longingly, a grand, unceasing contemplation on God and God's creation, instead of contemplating endlessly on lines of ailing patients, royals and commoners, friend and foe, ulcers and toothaches. My feeling is perhaps that if we read Maimonides' final chapter of the guide at face value, which perhaps we shouldn't, but if we do, then it may just turn out that in Maimonides' own combination of his knowledge of God, he saw no other option and no other delight than in serving his people tirelessly, in imitating a benevolent, loving, merciful, and compassionate God who clothes the naked, visits the sick, and buries the dead when there is no one else to bury them. Maybe, just maybe, Maimonides was speaking from his own experience and from the depths of his own daily sacrifice, and we, his readers and inheritors, are grateful that he did so. I would like to thank all of you who join us here again for what is close to the end of our series on Maimonides. I hope it hasn't been going on for too long and that you're still finding it valuable, and I hope this message manages to sink in for myself and maybe for some who hear it. Thank you so much. Speaking of kindness and generosity, thank you so much to our kind and generous patrons who support this project, allowing us to continue to think, explore, and bring these ideas together to the public. We hope you enjoyed and continue to enjoy, and we hope you'll join us for next episode, where we try and wrap up the final themes of Maimonides' rationalism and mysticism, what we may learn from both, and what perhaps his final ultimate goal of the guide was. And until then, keep seeking.